and so grouping of qualities that are collectively known as the Brahma Viharas or divine abidings. And these are qualities that many of you will be hopefully familiar with. The qualities of kindness, befriending, compassion, joyfulness, equanimity. There's a term in Pali, it's Chitta Vimuti, refers to the liberation of the heart. And I think this is usually associated with these qualities as pathways of waking up, doorways of awakening. I think it's, it's very necessary to acknowledge that in Buddhist psychology, mindfulness is never a standalone quality. It is part of an extended, harmonious, and functional family of qualities. Now, part of that family of mindfulness are these qualities of kindness, of compassion, of joyfulness, of equanimity. Mindfulness is not only not a standalone quality, it's really never seen as being an end in itself. It's a pathway of cultivation that leads to, to deepening in understanding and deepening in flourishing. And yesterday evening, John and I were reflecting on this theme of, of flourishing, of human flourishing. And I think it's helpful just to, to see the ways in which these qualities are so central to that flourishing. You know, truly sort of mature human being, a, a creative and engaged human being, really deeply knows how to inhabit and to embody these qualities of, of kindness, of compassion, of joyfulness and equanimity. So I would really encourage you not, not to see these qualities as somehow, you know, the side dishes on the menu or the poor cousins of mindfulness. They are integral to the whole landscape of mindfulness. John mentioned yesterday, I think, this word loka. I, by the way, John, are you all right with me kicking off? Absolutely fine. <laughs> As soon as I've started to. Um, John yesterday mentioned this word, this Pali word, loka, which you should translate it as world. And, you know, we live in, in many worlds, don't we? We certainly live in the world of conditions. You know, all of the conditions that we meet on a moment to moment, daily basis, through our sense doors, through events, through experiences. And of course, we live in the world of our own experience. And I think when we start to reflect upon these four qualities, you know, the question really comes to us about, you know, what kind of footprint do we wish to leave on the world? What kind of footprint do we wish to leave upon our own hearts and minds? Now, all of these qualities, uh, they are deeply relational. They require intimacy, closeness, connection. We don't love from a distance. You know, we don't find ourselves embodying compassion remotely. Joyfulness asks us to be deeply intimate and close with all things. And equanimity is really about being in the midst of all things. These are deeply aspirational practices deeply aspirational cultiva cultivations. And they also, I think, remind us pretty much of the, the kind of, you know, the, the essence, the essence of this path about caring, about caring not only inwardly, but for caring for all of those we encounter in our life. The Buddha had a quote, he says, Looking after yourself, one looks after others. Looking after others, one looks after oneself. How does one look after others by looking after oneself? 
by practicing mindfulness, developing it and making it grow? How does one look after oneself by looking after others? By patience, non-harming, friendliness and caring. I think in this quote, the Buddha is really, really actually describing, you know, our interrelatedness and how we thrive together and how this path, this practice is really not just about our own well-being, but about how we care for the world inwardly and outwardly. I think these are, are quite often quite challenging qualities to nurture and to develop because they, they swim against the tide of some of our most deeply rooted habit patterns. You know, they swim against the tide of, of aversion, of, of harshness, of, of, you know, bleakness, of, of reactivity. They swim against this tide, but they are truly worth cultivating and developing. In the Dhammapada, one of the early texts of the teaching, it says it's not difficult for us to engage in acts that undermine our well-being. It's far more difficult for us to cultivate qualities that lead us to thrive, that contribute to our well-being. Many of you will have been, I think, much more familiar with you know, teachings on kindness and compassion because they are very much central to mindfulness-based uh, practices. I, I think that qualities of joyfulness and equanimity are probably given much less attention, not because they are less worthy. I think sometimes it's almost a time question, you know, how do you actually fit all of this in? So this evening, John and I are really feeling that we would like to give more emphasis to the qualities of joyfulness and equanimity in our reflections. And just one last thing I'd like to mention before I hand over to, to John is, is uh, just to mention the ways that these qualities are spoken of in the early teachings. First of all, they're spoken of as being virtues. These are the ground of all ethical thoughts, words, and acts. They, they are acts of caring. They are, they are virtues. Uh, the ground of all healthy communities, of societies, of relationships with others, and of relationships with ourselves. They're also described as being seeds of potentiality. We're not contriving states, you know, we're not importing something that is not already present as a seed of potentiality within each of us that asks to be nurtured, that asks to be developed and to be brought to fruition. All of us have had moments of, uh, or encounters with unhesitating moments of kindness, whether receiving it from others or being able to offer an unhesitating hand of kindness to another. All of us have known moments of unhesitating compassion. We perhaps have been fortunate enough to receive it and we find ourselves also reaching out with compassion to others and to ourselves. All of us have had moments of joyfulness and sometimes surprisingly of equanimity. We know these as being seeds of potentiality capacities that live within each of our hearts and minds. I think what the Buddha has done, he has placed these qualities into the context of qualities that could be trained and developed as much as we train and develop our capacity for mindfulness. That these encounters don't have to be accidental or fleeting. That we can learn to nurture and to care for these seeds, bring them to fruition. So they become abidings, the place where our heart, our mind makes its home. They're also spoken of as being fruitions. 
you know, if you want to know the landscape of an awakened heart, it would be infused with these qualities. They can indeed be brought to fruition. And the Buddha speaks of them as being pathways, as I've mentioned, pathways to be developed. Okay, I think I'll pause there and hand over to John. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, I want to reflect a little bit on just on the, on the name that these particular practices have, which is Brahma Zahara, which doesn't mean much to you, I'm sure. Um, as equally, its standard translation, which is divine abidings, doesn't mean much in many ways. I want to put this in much more colloquial English. Uh, the, the term Brahma Vihara is very much situated in Indian thought of two and a half thousand years ago. Um, Brahma being the chief of the Hindu gods and uh, Vihara is a dwelling place. So it's actually dwelling with Brahma is literally what it means. Again, won't mean much to you. But if I put it this way, that dwelling with Brahma was meant to be a signification of some kind of liberation or wakefulness. And what is being indicated really by this term, and I kind of put it much more colloquial, is their paths to awakening, their paths actually to liberation. That's what's indicated by this metaphor that's being used by the Buddha when he encapsulates these under this term Brahma Vihara. And I think it's really worth hearing that because the pathway to liberation is enacted through these particular practices, as, as Christina has described them, their virtues. They're the foundations of our ethical behavior because virtue is the foundation of all ethics here. It's the development of ethics or the development of virtues which give rise to character and then character is what is enacted in the world, is what we enact in the world. And this is particularly stressed in the, you know, again, the ancient in Indian language Pali, uh, in that all of these terms are verbs. They're things that we do. They're not states that we dwell in. You know, even the word dwelling place, which is used in that term, is, is in some senses misleading in the sense that what these are indicating as pathways are activities that we engage in. You know, they're not ideas that we just foster in our minds. They're also bhavanas, they're cultivation. So there is metta bhavana, the cultivation of kindness and friendliness. Karuna bhavana, the cultivation of compassion or outgoing kindness. You know, these are things that we cultivate in our lives. And I think it was Christina who said yesterday, you know, we're always practicing something. In fact, we're always cultivating something. Um, and I think we should bear that in mind. So if we're not cultivating these things, we're often cultivating much more unwholesome states of mind. And so what it's actually giving is a pathway to being able to liberate ourselves by the actual cultivation of very, very basic virtuous activities, such as practicing kindness, practicing friendliness. Now, I don't know how that sounds to you, but when I first heard that when I was very young, when I first came across this, I thought, what a wonderful thing. This is not an intellectual path as much as we can make it into one. Um, it's very easy. The history of Buddhist thought has been uh, one of, you know, just like most traditions of a lot of thought around the basics. It's not a path of intellectualism. It's not even a path that, which is mystical. It's actually a path of the practice of kindness uh, as its foundation. So in a way, what we've got is a fundamental characteristic, which is the meta characteristic, which is then built on and expanded into these other spheres. So they're all connected. They all, to use a metaphor, which we'll probably recite later on, or a simile, they all grow out of that soil. They all grow out of the soil of kindness and friendliness. I would just add one other further translation term because many of you will come across this term meta as being translated 
as loving kindness. Um, come across this? I mean, some of you might, you know, the ones I've got on the screen might shake your head or nod your head or I don't know. It's often translated as loving kindness. Now, I really do want to say this is the worst possible translation of this term that you could ever get. <laughs> it is an absolutely hopeless translation um, of loving kindness. The term is derived from um, a word in Pali and Sanskrit, which means to befriend. Yeah. So what we're actually cultivating is good heartedness or friendliness towards things. I actually quite like good heartedness, yeah? the, the friendly good heart that moves towards others as opposed to being isolated and locked into itself. It moves out into the world. Um, so these Factors are cultivations, these things that we cultivate in our life and actually do. We don't just dwell on them or meditate on them. You know? We actively cultivate them and that's what's so important about them. And as such, in the Metta Sutta, which is the Sutta or text which is dedicated to the practice of Metta, Metta or this good heartedness, friendliness, kindness, is referred to as a mindfulness, yeah? using the standard translation. You know, so if we, when we start to bring kindness to observing our patterns of mind and Vedana, and that we're bringing a quality, which is a quality which is to be, to be developed in all aspects of our life, not just in one aspect, it actually moves out into life. By exhibiting friendliness to sometimes some distressing signals in our own life, some distressing states in our own life, some difficult states certainly in our own lives without judgment, this friendliness does not make a judgment of what to be friend. It doesn't mean I have to like it, but I can befriend things in my life. So. The qualities are based and rooted in, in this meta quality. So although we're not going to talk you know, a lot about these two terms, it is really important to understand that they're actually rooted in this basic quality of kindness, which is a basic quality all of us possess. We might not exhibit it very often, but we all of us possess it. We certainly have all received it in our lives, in, in the traditional practices, there is the practice of recalling somebody who's benefited you and being kind to you in your own life. Yeah. Actually actively helped you. And sometimes these are countless people. These are countless people we have received some degree of kindness from. Not massive acts, but just those little human acts of kindness. And we too have often given those little acts of kindness to others. Yeah. And this is the reciprocity that makes our world worth living in. This is the reciprocity that builds community, uh, communities that actually live, hopefully, without all the aversion and all the hatred. But in many senses, it has to start at home. It has to start towards our own processes of befriending those processes rather than seeing them as dangerous enemies to be battered away or to be repressed or to be judged harshly. We in the West, I think, have a very long legacy of treating ourselves very harshly. Yeah. And I think it's worth bearing that, my, that in mind because it's not always easy for us to move towards this friendliness, towards ourselves. It seems far easier to move towards another than it does towards ourselves and to befriend ourselves. To truly make a friend of yourself is really what it's about. Making a friend of yourself, you also learn to care for others by caring for yourself. Yeah as Christina quoted earlier on in that particular quote. So I'll pass it back to Christina now. Well, earlier on uh, in the day today, I referred to the four ways of establishing mindfulness, as our friend Akinchino puts it, as being these four channels that are always broadcasting. 
um, although we might highlight one channel over above another channel. In a very similar way, these four qualities of kindness, compassion, joyfulness, and equanimity, they are also deeply interrelated. But we do learn as cultivations to again shine the spotlight of attention on one at a particular time, perhaps another at a particular another time. Just a couple more, uh, more uh, meta statements about this. I mean, John's not just being pedantic and translating this word meta very specifically. Um, I actually really agree that this is so important. And meta is not just not just about good heartedness, it's a verb. It's about befriending, befriending. You know, the reason why I think it's so important to be accurate in this translation is I've met so many people who feel to be exiled from the cultivation of metta because they have the expectation that they are supposed to learn to love the difficult. This can even carry aspects of being abusive. You know, if you have someone, if you're teaching with someone or working with someone who's in a very difficult or an abusive relationship or living with some, you know, chronic pain or illness, it, it, it is asking really too much to ask them to love this. But they may very well be able to befriend it, to stand near to it, however near is safe. Sometimes metta is really cultivated at some intentional distance. Befriending, befriending. So I think just want to really remark that these practices like mindfulness as a cultivation are very much intention led. It's really not necessarily about what we feel. It's about what we value. And what we value and what we feel emotionally in any given moment may not always be concurring or in agreement. So these are intention led. They're actually commitments to that which we most deeply value as human beings. Now, Metta, as John uh, says, is really the foundation of the flourishing of all of the other qualities, just as simple knowing is the, flourish, is the basis for the flourishing of all other aspects of mindfulness. The second of these qualities, which we'll just touch upon briefly, this, quali this, word, this quality of compassion. Again, in, in Pali, the, 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 word, the words are anukampa karuna, um, which you know, we translate as compassion for mm -hmm. uh, lack of finding really a better translation. But I think it's also worth breaking this poly term down. Um, Anukampa really describes the empathic aspect of compassion. Sometimes it's talked about as being able to listen to the cries of the world. It's that quality of receptivity, of a, a deep inner, deep listening rooted in stillness not busy, not trying to find solutions, but the, that trembling of the heart in the face of suffering. This is Anukampa. Karuna has a different, uh, different meaning. It means to, to turn towards or to reach out to or to act, to act in response. Huh? To act, it is much more the engaged, the most active element of compassion, dedicated to relieving distress where it's encountered and dedicated to uprooting the causes or the roots of distress where they can be uprooted. So these two are very much in, in married together. And the, the empathy aspect is so crucial because when we, when we don't always stop to listen, to feel our hearts tremble in the face of suffering, sometimes that can be quite challenging. If, if we try to bypass that piece, we tend to get into busyness or trying to fix or strategizing to make something go away. 
And we know that not all distress can be ended. We know that the roots of distress cannot always be uprooted, but we act as if it's possible to do so. We act as if it's possible to do so. Sometimes the only action that can be offered is that deep empathy, that deep listening, that trembling of the heart. But sometimes something much more active is offered. And certainly in Buddhist psychology, when we speak about you know, the roots of distress or the conditions from which distress arises, of course, they're, they're multiple and manifold, but they are also deeply rooted in, in the patterns of greed and hatred and delusion. You know, in many of the ills in our world and many of the, much of the distress in individuals, you know, we can trace back to this, these, these deeply rooted habit patterns of, of greed and of, of ill will and of confusion. So Anukampa Karuna, it's fine to use the word compassion because Anukampa Karuna is a bit of a mouthful. But I think also to, to actually really have the sense of these two, two aspects of compassion is really important. Now I'm fine, John, if we want to move on to Mudita, if you, unless you have again some overall. I'll just add a couple of things to what you said, which is if we look at the relationship between metta karuna, particularly, um, as Christine has said, I mean, these words are actually beautiful words in the original languages. Um, anukampa, for example, um, comes from the Sanskrit word anukrosha, which actually means to cry out at the crying out of another. Yeah. So in other words, it's a resonance that sees pain and other here doesn't just mean human others, it means sentient others, you know, to see what's going on within you know, the, the world of human beings and animals and to see that distress and to cry out at it. You know. This is a foundation of an ethical behavior. It stems directly from that softening that comes through friendliness. Yeah? Friendliness being in, in the sense that friendliness is something that we can cultivate and then gives rise to an activity. And the activity, I tend to move away from the word compassion these days and really talk about an outgoing kindness. Yeah? A kindness which stems from and flows out of, directly out of the softening of the heart by metta. Yeah. that cries out when it sees suffering, but turns towards it rather than turning away from it. Yeah. The word karuna comes from two roots, one which means, uh, I think Christina touched on this, which means to turn outwards, to actually see, to recognize it, not to turn away from it. It also means to turn away from ourselves, our own self and selfish concerns to see the distress of others. Yeah. The other route it comes from, again, Christina touched on it, is and some of you may do yoga, may know there's a form of yoga, which is called Kriya Yoga. The same root is there in, in, in Karuna. It's a root Kri, which is there in Kriya and Karu. And it's there and indicates activity. It means doing something. So Karuna, is not something you simply feel. It's not a nice feeling that washes over you as you sit there in your meditation thing. It's something that gives rise to action. It's something you do. You know? Compassion, or in my phrase, outgoing kindness, is something you enact. It's an embodied experience. It's not a mental state to which I just sit, sit in with a nice sort of soothing smile on my face about feeling compassion. It's something you actually go and do. So these two are very, very closely rooted together. And as you can see, particularly this last one with both the way um, Christine has spoken about it and the way I have spoken about it is that of course, this is rooted in the recognition of suffering. Yeah suffering and distress in the world, our own suffering and the distress of others in the world. 
And so when we come to the mudita or joyful aspect, we've got something which counterbalances the distress that we perceive in the world. And I'll pass you back to Christina. Okay, so let's come to this quality of joyfulness. The way that this is often placed in the listing of this collection of qualities, the word in Pali is mudita, um, which has its, its roots in to gladden, to gladden the heart or to liberate the heart through gladness. Now, in the, in the Brahma Viharas, Mudita is generally uh, really referring quite directly to appreciative joy, our capacity to celebrate the goodness and the wellness and the good fortune of others. And I, I have no disagreement with this. But I also feel that as a quality, it's really worthwhile expanding our reflection of what we understand about joyfulness and how it's cultivated and how really important it is, how, how necessary it is. Again, I want to read you a, a quote from the Dhammapada. Where the Buddha says, live in joy in good heartedness, even amongst those who hate. Live in joy in health, even amongst the afflicted. Live in joy in peace, even amongst the troubled. Look within, be still, free from fear and clinging. Know the sweet joy of the way. And I think what has been indicated here is that you know, we're not speaking about some dissociated state here. We are speaking about how we abide in the midst of all things, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of affliction, in the midst of hatred, how we are abiding, how we are present in the midst of all things, which is why I, I feel it, it's actually really important to, to kind of have a, a, a more expansive view of how joyfulness is spoken about in this teaching. Although, you know, somewhat traditionally, the Brahma Viharas are ordered as kindness, compassion, joyfulness, equanimity. These days, much more, I find myself actually shifting that ordering around somewhat and, and looking at kindness and joyfulness and compassion and equanimity. And part of that has really... Um, emerge from my conversations over the last 18 months when I've uh, you know sometimes been teaching or uh, conversing with people who were really working on the front lines of, of, of COVID you know in, in ITUs and um, educators and you know in, in doctors and nurses and you know, this theme of, of, you know, this incredible dedication and goodness of heart that has led them to do the work that they do. And also the incredible demands of the last 18 months. And that sometimes despite that incredible dedication, you know, the deep, deep understandable feelings of fatigue and burnout. And, and one, one nurse, one intensive care nurse saying, you know, I, I can't afford to feel anymore. I can't afford to feel anymore. And I really had the sense that, you know, in a way, it, there was no absence of compassion. You know, there was no absence of dedication, but there was this really under-resourcing inwardly, deeply under-resourced. And somehow, you know, I think compassion and joy are such necessary allies you know, that it, that it is really joyfulness that renews us in the face of the real difficult, in the face of real distress. It's the cultivation of joyfulness that allows us to show up, you know, and, uh, and to see anew, to, to revitalize in many ways us energetically. There is nothing frivolous about joyfulness, 
name it. Sometimes people struggle with joyfulness because they, you know, they say, well, you know, there is so much distress, there is so much pain, there's so much loss that somehow it's superficial or frivolous to cultivate joyfulness. No, without it, compassion is at risk of withering. Some people will struggle with joyfulness because they feel they don't deserve it. You know, they feel that they just simply don't deserve joyfulness because of who they believe themselves to be. Some people find because even of, you know, sometimes certain religious backgrounds that there's something more virtuous in suffering than in cultivating joyfulness. It is so central in this path to, to gladden the heart and to liberate the heart through gladness. And in the teaching, the Buddha speaks about joyfulness in a number of different ways, not just as appreciative joy. I just want, if I pass back to John, I really want to say another reason why this is so important. I think, you know, so many people I speak with really, really speak about, you know, living with a, a sense of insufficiency, of not being enough, not having enough, not being good enough, you know, and this deficit culture that is so often inherited and conditioned, um, I think really it suffocates joyfulness. It suffocates joyfulness. And actually, it really is so much at the root of so much of the agitation of craving that we can experience. You know, I don't have enough, therefore I get busy about how to have more, you know, how to have more. And the cultivation of joyfulness inwardly is in many ways a healer of that sense of insufficiency. It's a healer of the sense of insufficiency. You know, I noticed, you know, with my, my, my youngest grandchild, my, my granddaughter is only just finding language. Um, she's just a little over one, which is almost one and a half. Um, uh, you know, she, she's really discovered, really knows the difference now between the pleasant and the unpleasant, you know, and has really learned already at 18 months old about how to externalize pleasure and pain. And she doesn't have very many words yet, but one of the her first words, is more, more. Every time there's a pleasant encounter, more, more. And I think about how young we are when we learn this, you know, how young we are when we learn this. Um, and if I don't get the more, you know, the disappointment and the tantrums and, you know, the meltdowns and more. Joyfulness, we don't learn at the same age as we learn craving. Sometimes we're, we're quite late learners in our life around joyfulness, never too late learners around joyfulness. Um, and I really, really encourage you to, to consider what it is that gladdens your hearts. John, I I think it's very indicative, um, picking up on something Christina was talking about here, I think it's very indicative, for example, that religious traditions have often <clears throat> scorned that sense of joyfulness within them. Not all, but some have. Some of you may know the, um, the book written by Umberto Eco, which was The Name of the Rose. And if you remember the story about that, it was the attempt to basically suppress um, Aristotle's book on comedy. Um, the book on tragedy was fine, but the book on comedy was something that had to be suppressed because it led to laughter and joyfulness within this. And I think, you know, actually deep in the heart sometimes, I think it's very difficult not to, to fall into the trap of going down the route of distress. And of course, when we experience distress, we get into that loop that really Christina was talking about. You know, how do we, how do we cope with our distress? Well, we, we cope with it by trying to fill up the hole in our being, in our sense of being. There's often a vacuity at the heart of our sense of being that needs filling. 
you know, what Christine is referring to as a sense of insufficiency, I would refer to as a hole in our sense of being. And we're trying to fill it up with something. So accumulation, it doesn't have to be material accumulation. It can be all sorts of accumulation that we do to try and fill ourselves up. It's a failed project that gives rise to more distress often. We can never fill ourselves up. There will always be that hole there. Joy is, is a way of actually beginning to experience life not just as a whole, but as somehow complete. Yeah? We have all the requisite things. Uh, if, as I said the other night, that we're not in a situation where we don't have the basics, we have the phenomena that we need to be complete and whole beings. We have the capacity going back for that kindness, we have that capacity to be you able know, to empathize with others, to move towards others, to act with great kindness. Do we fulfill that potential rather than accumulate? And that's a question, and I'm going to leave it open. We don't often tend to do that. We tend to be involved in our own projects and our own concerns. The joyfulness that's being spoken about here is not an ecstatic state. The word mudita actually derives again, I'm sorry about the linguistics, but I think it's important with these words. The word mudita derives from a root, which means actually to experience gentle joy. Gentle joy, not an ecstatic state. Yeah. And this is like the, the background to our living our living, our lives. That gentle joyfulness is like the ripple, the wave that runs through okay, and sustains us and energizes us. Yeah. And it's born out of the ability also to empathize, to be with, to experience our, our own pain and the pain of others. And this is not laughing at it. This is actually a joyfulness born of the human condition, which involves sometimes pain and distress. Yeah. It involves pain and distress. Just by being human, it will come upon us inevitably. Yet the way of, in a, the, the way of being able to face that, to move towards it rather than run away from it, is the energetics that's provided by appreciative joy. Now I will say that because appreciative joy is not just I think the way the tradition has, has sort of almost sort of boiled it down to just appreciating the good fortune. No I think it's a bigger sense of appreciation. It's an appreciation which is linked to a fundamental sense of flourishing to appreciate what is giving itself to us constantly in this world but we're often ignoring. Yeah. I don't know what your day has been like um, in Ireland, you know, in terms of weather and trees and greenness and everything else. Often this goes unnoticed because of our concerns, our projects, our having to get things done, our multitasking, all the words that I think are all too familiar in this world. And we don't see what is there, which actually nourishes us. Yeah, it's an appreciative. And even if we're not feeling that sometimes for ourselves, that sense of, you know, we might be in states of distress or despair, but to sometimes just to see the smile on another's face, yeah. to appreciate their joy, to appreciate their good fortune. You know? I think this is actually one of the most difficult practices. I think the other two practices are relatively easy in comparison with the practice of putting joy at the heart of your life, installing it in central place in your life. Not above the other two aspects that we've spoken about, albeit very briefly so far, the, the compassion or the outgoing kindness and the friendliness that constitutes the basis from which we move into these other states but it really has to be at the heart because otherwise we get that skewed 
sense of life where it skews towards the distress and trying to fill ourselves up, trying to escape the, our own distress of, again, using Christina's word, the sense of insufficiency. But the insufficiency is not just our sense of insufficiency, it's the insufficiency of the world doesn't give me what I want. Yeah, no matter how much I get, I don't feel content, happy. I very rarely experience joyfulness in those states. So the joyfulness that's being spoken about comes about, I think, through a deep, deep appreciation of all that life has to offer, which includes its pain and suffering, but also includes its great beauty. And I wanted to just read, if I've got it here, which I think I have, yes. A very short quote, this comes from a, a Western author rather than the Buddhist source. The beauty and the mystery of this world only emerges through affection, attention, interest and compassion. Open your, wide, open your eyes wide and actually see the world by attending to its colours and its detail and its irony. I think it's a beautiful phrase. Yeah. This is the way that we awaken the world through affection, attention, interest and compassion. But we need to open our eyes to really see the detail of the world that we live in, not just the distressing aspects of it, but all of its beauty. I'm not wiping away the distressing, but all of its beauty as well. Christina. I think it becomes apparent the way that mindfulness or sati and joyfulness as well as all of these other qualities really go hand in hand and as john is saying that ability that willingness to to be touched by willingness to be touched by the wholehearted presence sufficient enough that we can be touched by mindfulness really supports this my understanding is that the chinese calligraphy character for busyness translates as heart killing. And I, I think we, we know this in our own experience, that our projects are so consuming, our distractions so many, how difficult it is to be truly wholehearted, even now, in just being able to, to listen and to be here fully. There's a wonderful saying from the Chinese, it says, if you keep a green bough alive in your heart, the singing bird will come. And I think the green bow is the bow of mindfulness, wakefulness, wholeheartedness. The Buddha speaks about joyfulness on so many different levels as, you know, the world would be a much poorer place without wonderful art and music and poetry. Um, you know, this helps us to gladden the heart. It reminds us of our capacity for gladness. Um, to be able to go outside and deeply appreciate, be touched by the beauty around us. This is not necessarily a distraction from the practice. Our practice is not made more virtuous by ignoring that which is lovely. The Buddha speaks about the joyfulness that we find through gratitude, through thankfulness. Yeah how this too gladdens our heart, how we, we learn to be grateful, to not take things for granted, not the things that we have or the people in our lives, but to be appreciative, to be grateful. He also speaks about the joyfulness that we taste through a well-trained mind. In fact, he says a disciplined mind is the home of true joy. It is so interesting. A disciplined mind is the home of true joy. The mind that is well collected, well gathered, you begin to taste the sweetness of that stillness. You know, one of the reasons why we, we, we do promote a little bit, you know, formal practice, it's because for many people, it is through developing that stillness in practice that they begin to taste so what sometimes is referred to as a, a non-sensual or a non-worldly or a non-fleshy joy, the joyfulness that is generated inwardly. 
the joyfulness that is generated in a mind that feels to be a good friend, in a body, mind, heart that is collected and unified. It has a taste and it has a taste of joyfulness, much to be savored, much to be inspired by. It, it also changes our relationship to the world around us. You know, if you really have that taste of an inwardly generated joyfulness, it has a really profound effect on how we engage with the world around us. You know, craving has its roots in insufficiency. If that insufficiency fades, you know, and your taste is inwardly generated happiness, peace, joyfulness, you know, craving doesn't really have a root anymore. It doesn't really have a root anymore. You know, there truly is a sense of there is enough just here, just now, in this, this well-trained, this well-cultivated heart and mind. John, we need what, 10 minutes, John, to, to cover the great ground of equanimity. Okay, I just want to say a couple of more words about uh, the joyfulness, because I think this is one of these areas which gets neglected so much. I mean, actually, equanimity, where we're coming on to, often gets spoken about also quite a lot, because, it, again, it's vitally important. But joy, for some reason, gets locked out uh, in many ways, or just a very quick... Um, skimming over and consigning to this idea of we've just got to appreciate the joy of others. And this is not really what it's really not what it's about. We have to learn to evoke a sense of wonder in ourselves as well. This is that the heart of a deep joyfulness that we can experience at being alive. Why do we not experience that when we, I don't know, encounter the tree, encounter the animal, encounter another human being. It's because often of familiarity. Yeah? It becomes, the familiarity becomes a way of ignoring, of not seeing the wondrousness or the awe or the amazement of the other, you know, whether that be a human other or the other that inhabits the world in some way or another. The poet Wallace Stevens, in a kind of almost note to himself, you know, an American who died in the 1950s, poet, he said, you must become an ignorant man again and see the sun again with an ignorant eye. Yeah. How often can we do that? That's the capacity that sometimes children have to encounter something anew. We can only really move towards this deep sense of appreciation and joyfulness when we are encountering things as if for the first time. Yeah. Think about this in terms of practice. This is a real practice to see if we can encounter things anew. That means often dropping all of our concepts and stories that surround a person, a thing, a place, you know, a, a view, a vista, the sun, you know, oh yes, there's another sunset. <laughs> One says boringly, you know, as if you're not moved by this at all. So joy lies in that deep appreciation of all that life has to offer, that richness by encountering it again. And that's really the last words I have to say about this. But as you can see, this is quite a task. And I think to encounter this actually in your practice, the familiar thoughts, the familiar feelings, the familiar, see if you can just drop some of the judgments and the concepts and the ways that we hold these things to re-encounter those things. Of course, they're not going to be new in the way that you did encounter these things when you were younger and as children and that. But there is a possibility of a, an invigoration through an encounter with something I think I understand and know, but actually don't. Okay, I'll pass it back. Okay, so um, John, we, we really only have five minutes left and I'm a little reluctant to give equanimity only a very, you know, kind of cursory visit. 
And I'm actually glad that we've spent more time with this theme of joyfulness this evening. So I'm thinking that we can probably find a way to weave equanimity into more into tomorrow evening's talk and, and do it some some justice rather than I just agree. Otherwise yeah. we're kind of shoehorning it in yeah, to yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so why don't we do that? We'll 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 find a way of, of weaving it into tomorrow evening. Um, and to end this evening, I, I think I would really just that invitation to really appreciate that joy is not just joyfulness, is not just a feeling. It's not a dissociated state. That is, is a way of abiding in the midst of all of the conditions of our lives, no matter how deeply challenging they may be. Joyfulness teaches us something about coexistence. You know, the coexistence of, of that happens in every moment of our lives. Yes, there can be that which is, you know, so difficult and so challenging. And yet still we can listen to and be touched by the sound of a bird or the laugh of a child. And it is knowing that, that this, these can live side by side. And I think in acknowledging that coexistence, and actually nurturing that sense of coexistence, we're less likely to contract just around the difficult. So cultivating joyfulness, gladness, sometimes it's just so simple as stepping out of our doors or looking out the window and deeply appreciating you know, the space around the tree, the space around the clouds, the colors, the, the everything that the world brings to us, there is much that is lovely. Okay, so why don't we end?